I didn't know it at the time, but he had launched uh, a, a grenade from the rooftop as well. So I took a grenade to the gut. Um, so I had a bunch of shrapnel come in through the bottom of my flak. So my name is uh, Danny Santos. I served in the United States Marine Corps from uh, 2001 to 2021. I retired as a Master Sergeant E8. So I originally started off as a 0311 infantry uh, man, and I transitioned to 0372 critical skills operator and retired as a Marine Raider. So um, originally from Los Angeles, California, uh, grew up in the Rampart District there, um, and eventually moved uh, to South Central. Um, I think I have a pretty interesting background. So I'm first generation Salvadorian. Uh, my family came to the U.S. Uh, in, in the late 70s, fleeing the Civil War in El Salvador, trying to you know give us a better life for ourselves. Um, so my dad arrived in 1979. My mom arrived in, in 1980, and we landed in, in a heavy populated uh, Rampart district where there's a lot of Salvadoreños, Guatemaltecos, and Honduras um, people. And that's where it originally started, man. Um, eventually, you know, my dad was working for jobs. He came across the border, crazy story, in the back of a beat-up Toyota Corolla with uh, his best friend and four other dudes in, in the trunk. Um, late one night, he told me the story. They were there, and they were crossing the border. My dad almost passed out, and they were giving each other mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, just to come and, and make it, you know, and... Um, I say that because that instilled to me the amount of sacrifice that my parents had to take the, the big step of coming over here, and, you know, trying to achieve something better for myself. And that's kind of how we ended up in, in South Central LA from the Rampart District, where uh, we were one of the first Salvadorian families on this block uh, where they actually bought a house. And uh, I grew up there, man, in the hood. You know how it is there. It's full of uh, gang activity, for, full of drug uh, and violence stuff. Uh, a lot of distractions to prevent you from achieving your, your best potential. And with being first generation hardworking parents, you know, my dad had four jobs that like ranged from a courier to being a manager at a steel factory and making wheels. My mom was sewing golf bags in a sweatshop in downtown Los Angeles or some illegal Chinese company or whatever. Um, so it really paid a, a big toll on on uh, the way they raised me and they did their best. And unfortunately, you know, for my dad, he kind of dealt with that stuff with uh, with alcohol and uh, uh, alcoholism was a big part of, of his life. And due to the stress and the mistakes he made, as an alcoholic, um, you know, he ended up taking his life when I was about 10 years old. Um, he died by suicide, hung himself in that same house that he fucking bought for us uh, back in the day. Um, but what I, what I do want to highlight about that is regardless of how it all happened, uh, the one thing that my parents never let me forget about is where uh, I come from. And my dad did this by, I remember taking me to El Salvador at a really young age. So before I joined the Marine Corps, I used to go to El Salvador for three months every year consecutively. My parents used to take me and I was there for three months and then I would come back. But I distinctly remember the first time I went to El Salvador with my dad. He was like, hey, we're going to go back. Uh, I'm going to show you where you come from. Um, and you're going to meet your family and you're going to see what I left. So we went. And uh, I remember the town where we we're, we're from is called La Junta, which is where these two rivers meet in this uh, deep valley and it has this huge hill. You go up the hill, we walked up the hill, and I uh, walked up to his house. Mud walls, you know, um, no concrete floors or anything. My grandma's still there. And uh, he's just like, hey, look, this is where I grew up at. There's no running water, there's no electricity. You know, this is what I left. So I want you to remember this so you can understand the sacrifices that I made and what you need to do to be a better person uh, here. And then we, you know, we finished that trip and on the way back, uh, you know, I told you El Salvador at that time was already involved in a crazy civil war at the time. And we're on these horses riding down the river and we see something in the river, man, and he stops and he gets off and he's like, get off the horse or whatever. 
And he's like, I want you to take a look at this. And so I'm just like, what are we looking at? So we come up to the riverbank and he's like, it's a body, dude. It's the first time I saw a dead body. And he's like, look, this is El Salvador. This is what our people are going through right now. This is why I left. And this is why you don't need to come back. But you need to understand that you need to continue to go forward. Your name, your Santos, your name is going to be somebody in the future. Don't ever forget where you came from. I was like, but don't ever come back. So to me, that always like stood out, right? He wasn't able to deal with his situation, whatever the case may be. Uh, but I took those lessons. Now I have Santos tattooed on my chest for a reason. So as I go through and I represent myself, as a member of the Santos family, I know that like the sacrifices that my parents both made are gonna continue to drive me. So I'll never forget the sacrifices uh, they, they made. And oh, that's awful to hear, man, to, to have to go through that at such a young age at 10. Yeah. Um, how did your, uh, how was your mom? How did she take that? My mom's a super strong woman, man. Uh, she went through her own depression. I didn't know what depression was at the time. I just wondered like why my mom slept so much, why she was never active in my life as much as possible. She worked really hard. She worked the graveyard shift for the Wall Street Journal for 20 years. Wow. Um, you know, and she was like always working at night and was sleeping during the day, not only because she was tired, but because she, she was depressed. Um, so I had to learn those lessons myself. And finally now as a parent, um, I understand how difficult it might be to lose your, your partner and the one person you were you know, uh, going through struggles with together, um, specifically through suicide, right? Not understanding what the consequences were, how to deal with that stuff. Right, right. So, um, what 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 eventually inspired you to join the military? Uh, it's funny, man. So, like, we get all these stories, right? And everybody's like, "Hey, I was inspired because of nine eleven. I was inspired because this happened to uh, you know my friend or whatever." Um, I'm opposite, man. One hundred percent. I'll tell you, I join the military because I didn't have any other choice and I didn't think I didn't have any opportunities to leave such a fucked up neighborhood. I already had found myself dealing with drugs and gangs and all that stuff. And I, I was still successful kind of in school. I knew I was a smart guy, but the reason I told that story before because it always resonated in me that I was knew I was doing bad shit and I was letting down my dad and the sacrifices he made, and I had to make a drastic change not to completely go down that path. Um, so I decided that I needed to bounce, and the only way I could leave as fast as possible was to join the military. So I ended up uh, fighting the for everybody that's old enough and watching this, right? Everybody remembers the Yellow Pages. So I had opened up the Yellow Pages. <laughs> And I uh, found like the recruiting station on there. And I just walked in. I walked into the first door that was open. And I told the dude, I was like, hey, I want to leave in 30 days. And the guy was like, sure, sign here. And uh, calls me back in two weeks. And he's like, hey, man, uh, you know, I'm not going to be able to get you out of here in 30 days. You're going to have to wait. I was like, all right, cool. Well, he calls me back a week later, like at 11 o'clock at night. I was uh, coming back from work and he was like, hey man, you still want to leave? I was like, sure. He's like, I got a dude that doesn't want to get on the bus. Come to the office right now, sign your papers. So I was already 19 at the time. He's like, you can be in San Diego at five in the morning. Wow. So I literally went, signed my papers, got in, uh, and uh, I was on the foot yellow, foot yellow footsteps at 5.30 in the morning. The next day in my work clothes, I never quit school. I never quit my job. Uh, and uh, it just so happens too, by the way, that I joined the Marine Corps because when I joined the military, I didn't know there were different services uh, or anything uh, like that. I just walked to the first door that was open and it had uh, to be the Marines. Um, oh, wow. And that was August 28th, man. So I was actually in boot camp when 9-11 uh, happened. Really? Yeah. I was uh, on the grinder, you know, stepping it out. And uh, right next to San Diego, you guys know that you know, the airplanes continue to fall. I mean, uh, land there all the time. And 9-11 happened while we were there. Um, our senior drill instructor pulled us in and uh, asked us, I was like, uh, who's uh, who in here is uh, infantry? And I threw my hand up, me and my other guy, and I looked around and there was only like three or four hands up out of like a hundred dudes. And I was like, what the fuck do you do? 
And they're like, oh, I'm an aircraft mechanic, dude. I was like, I thought everybody in the Marine Corps was infantry. I didn't know there was other MOSs or anything like that. <laughs> wow. So the recruiter didn't never even present, like, ask you, what do you want to do? No, I was just like, all right, dude, I want to leave in 30 days. And I guess 0311 was the fastest way to get me out. And that's what I got. And that's what I ended up showing up with. I didn't know anything was going to happen. Wow. That was my job. You were the you were the golden recruiter. <laughs> yeah, golden recruiter. <laughs> wow, man. Uh, but yeah, man, that's how I ended up in the Marine Corps and the whole uh, you know patriotism and brotherhood and all that other stuff. Uh, for me, ended up uh, coming late, man. It's like it's the first time I'll probably tell it. You know, I was just an angry kid that had a fucked up unbrigade that needed to make a drastic change. Yeah, and I was just like really angry and I needed somewhere to leave. Did you avoid? Um, I'm going back a little bit. Did, were you able to avoid the gang life? Like, you know, I know growing up in the in the streets like that, where you're from, you're always pressured to to be getting jumped into the neighborhood, specifically to where you live. Um, how was that? How was that experience for you? I I never ended up gang banging, man, but it was like really close. You know, like all the dudes uh, that I hung out with were just doing bad stuff. Uh, you had to be homeboys with uh, the neighborhood where I grew up at. Um, the Crips were deep where I was at, and then being Salvadorian too, and it was a lot of influence to join uh, those dudes as well. Um, so I had to balance that stuff. You know, Rampart District is full of all the homies there, and then South Central is even worse than with the mix of everything. So I managed to stay enough away from it to understand that I didn't want to do that as a lifestyle, mm -hmm. and I could have easily just gone and you know been an OG in the neighborhood, but I chose not to do it. Mm. So 9-11 happens while you're in boot camp. Um, did you feel like your experience in boot camp changed? Uh, did the DIs talk to you about anything, the drill instructors, what, once that happened? Or Yeah, I remember the conversation that we had was like, hey, you four that are infantry in here is like, I'll guarantee you in one year you'll be at war. Um, and uh, that was true. Uh, within one year, you know, we're invading the country. Uh, and, and my whole perspective on what, my job was now had changed. Uh, what unit did you get dropped to? Uh, so luckily I ended up going to good old 29 Palms and I was part of uh, 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines, Kilo Company, 3rd Platoon, call sign Kilo 33. Nice. Talk to me about your experience with uh, that unit. Well, Kilo 33, man, 7th Marines, uh, you know, we rock and roll out in 29 Palms all the time. Uh, we had a, a pretty extensive invasion um, and we did that whole nine month tour but for me i think the most substantial deployment while i was in the infantry was in uh, 2004 uh we got redeployed back to uh the syrian border uh kilo company was assigned to uh clear and relieve um uh, a company of army guys in al Qaim, uh which is right into the syrian border and then uh for us it was so significant in uh april of 2004, April 17th, um, I actually got shot. Mm -hmm. um, that day for us was pretty intense because three days before that, uh, Corporal Jason Dunham, the first Marine to receive the Battle of Honor, had got injured while he jumped on a grenade, uh, saving three of his guys. So our whole company was kind of on alert on what was going on behind that. And on April 17th, we finally got the call. It came through the mosques. Uh, there was about 150, 100 fighters that had come in into all time to specifically just get it on, and they, they called us out. Um, and they said, hey, if you guys want to come fight, we're here. So Kilo Company <clears throat> got called. The Lima Company was already in the city of Puseba uh, fighting it out all morning, and they had already taken like six or seven casualties to include uh, the company commander, Captain Gannon. And uh, we went out, and uh, us as Kilo Company, our task was basically to clear the city from uh, south to north. My specific job during that day was um, we got in, I inserted stay, uh, they provided our old watch for us, and then I got the leftmost flank of the company objective. So I was the furthest squad to the left of uh, the company when everything kicked off. Um, I had about eight dudes with me at that time because we weren't fully uh, manned up, and then I had the platoon uh, sergeant with me. 
and it, it kicked off man uh we started getting the good old firefight as soon as uh the order went out for us to to start the, our clearing operation and my squad was heavily engaged right off the bat so we were taking rpg shots and i heard extensive rates of fire coming from other streets so as a squad leader I knew I had to cover more ground fast, and I don't know if it was the right decision, but I made a decision to split us up. So I split my two fire teams up, and I took one. At the platoon sergeant, I took another one. And unfortunately, as that other element took off, uh, the rate of fire increased a lot more. So I knew I probably had fucked up. And I went around and uh, you know attempted to help them out. And in the midst of all that, we ended up coming around a corner and uh, we saw this machine gun getting at those dudes and just had them pinned down. So my point man had already launched a couple of small rockets and he uh, was getting at it with, with the saw and uh, that machine gun turned around and saw me and him and I were going at it in the in the middle of the street and uh, I got shot in the shoulder and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but he had launched uh, a, a grenade from the rooftop as well. So I took a grenade to the gut um, so I had a bunch of shrapnel come in through the bottom of my flak, hit me on my inside of my legs and uh, um, above uh, everything else that's going on down there. And I had my point man laying in the street with three gunshot wounds uh, to his back. So kind of woke up from the grenade blast, uh, realized what's going on and realized I was missing a dude and come to find out Sosa Chavez is his name, it was actually his birthday that day as well, was uh, was laying in the street um, and uh, I was yelling for him, he popped around the corner and uh, he just was going like this, like be quiet, be quiet. And I was like, what the fuck's going on? Popped back around. What I didn't know, we came to find out later on, uh, he had just got dead checked. So like these three dudes had jumped over the wall, saw him laying in the street and they went to dead check him and he played dead and they, they left him alone. So, no fucking shit. Yeah. They didn't fucking know. They didn't. They're not. He was bleeding from his ass and his back and everything. So he just looked all fucked up and he just played possum. They would have just executed him. Yeah. Right so that's what when I popped up and I was yelling at him, he was just like telling me to be quiet because the dude has, had just jumped over the wall and left him alone. Oh. Uh, but then we started getting hit again. So I had no choice. I ran. I grabbed Sosa Chavez and uh, me him and my point man fought our way out back up around another corner and I threw him behind uh, a, a big old bulldozer. I remember that was right there next to us and I left him there, you know, because I still had to go get the other element that was getting and, and engaged. At, at this point, you're shot. So I ran shot in the shoulder. I got shrapnel in the gut. I was sitting behind this bulldozer. My boy John Stamper. It, it was classic movie shit, man. Like, I'm bleeding, I pull my shit down, blood's everywhere, and I'm just like, John, you gotta look, man, am I good? <laughs> and I, he gives me the tap on the back, and he's like, hey, man, you're still good down there. I was like, hell yeah, let's fuck it on. Uh, you know, after that, I grabbed Sosa, and we went, and like, um, I had to go find the other element, and what I didn't know is like they had been pinned down, and uh, uh, Staff Sergeant Walker at the time was shot through the arm, and through the leg as well. So I grabbed those guys and we consolidated ourselves in a in an apartment building, a two-story house and fought it out for like about four hours because unfortunately at the time in the grunts, you know, not everybody had a radio. Mm -hmm. So I had three casualties. We were stuck in this house. We'd up, set up sectors of fire on the rooftop and uh, I, we got low on ammo and I was literally distributing ammo to the guys in county rounds and we're like, hey man, this is all we got. We're, we we got to fight it out. And uh, like two hours later, somebody found us. They sent a runner, told them what was going on. They ran back. We continued to fight it out. And they finally came back with some stretchers. And they were like, hey, man, can't get, get in here with you guys. It's like, it's too hot. The rest of the company is still in a firefight. We're going to need to fucking patrol out of here with all the casualties. So consolidated everybody again, you know, distributed ammo. And we've patrolled another thousand meters out with dudes on stretchers and me being wounded in the shoulder. Wow. And, uh, yeah. Shrapnel all up in my gut. Did you, uh, at, at any, you know, did you at all address your wounds at all? Uh, 
eventually you did yeah so like uh I, not my gut my gut stayed open whatever the, the holes that i had in there uh my gunshot luckily hit my clavicle and just went right through my trap and so like mm -hmm. it, it was just a bunch of blood but it wasn't too too crazy mm -hmm. um but we addressed the other guys' wounds which is they were bleeding out a lot more than i did i i felt like i couldn't leave the squad just hang in and hang out in the limb room of this house you know we had to fight it out did you end up losing anybody not my squad uh, on that firefight. Um, unfortunately, the rest of the deployment continued something like that. And uh, Kilo 3-3 became combat ineffective, that deployment. Mm -hmm. um, July 5th, uh, I lost about three dudes from my squad. And no, that was, I was already stateside, but mm -hmm. that was a, it was a rough one. So after uh, when you guys made it back out of this situation, you got sent home? I got sent home, yeah. So we ended up linking up with the, actually the guys that got hurt on uh, April 14th with Jason Dunham and linked up with Jason Dunham and those guys in uh, in Germany. Um, we all got put on the same bird together and we flew back uh, to Bethesda together. And I stayed back stateside um, trying to heal up from my wounds from there. Wow, man. That's wild. That is some movie shit, man, you know? Uh... It's crazy. How 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 did you feel? Like, did you just have so much adrenaline that it didn't, you know, were you in pain? Obviously, you were in pain, but it sounds like you were just more focused on the mission and taking care of your guys and finding a way out. Yes, 100%, man. You know, it was my decision that caused us to be there, and so I wasn't just going to roll over and, you know, not give it everything we had. So I knew I was responsible for everybody there. Um I used my aggressiveness to, you know, to try to do as much as I could that day um, and, you know, make decisions that I thought were correct at the time. I'm not going to lie. Like, looking back at it, that's one of the things that probably most likely messed me up for a long time. Um, but in combat situations, right, like, you just need to make a decision. And me, I think I was like a 20-year-old kid in charge of eight dudes, um, but that's the best I can do. I'd yeah, you know exactly. And and I think the most important part is that you made the decision because yeah. uh, not making one could potentially get you killed. So it's easy to look back in hindsight, right? And and look at all the mistakes that we made in certain situations um, throughout life in general. It's easy to look back. So um, yeah, man. It, it's uh, but unfortunately, sometimes the decisions you make. You know, I'm not saying it was the wrong decision. I wasn't fucking there. Who knows what would have happened if you would have made the other decision? You know what I mean? Yeah. Who knows what went wrong during that time? So it's just fucking part of war, right? 100%, man. Like, and now in retrospect, when I look at it, it's like, I don't call them wrong decisions anymore. I just call it lessons learned, right? So you just got to understand, like, what lesson can I learn from that action that I took that day? And that rolls through life now, too. You know, we're talking combat now, and as we go through, the only way you're going to be better is by making certain mistakes and having good learning points. So what's going through your mind while you're at home uh, healing or in the hospital or, you know, throughout this whole process of, of you healing? It sucked, man, because at that time, the rink where they didn't have anything set up. So you basically had like the walking wounded rot run around the barracks and had dudes that were shot in the face. I was shot in the shoulder trying to heal up holes in my body. There wasn't a set plan of how they were going to rehabilitate us. I mean, they fucking send us to the rifle range. All I wanted to do was, like, get better. So I was kind of on my own. Like, I ended up just, there was no physical therapy at the time. Um, my wounds ended up healing, and six months later, I was, I was already running and gunning again. Six months later? Yeah. And you went, you had to go like qualify at the rifle range yeah. while you were. Like, the, that's the fucking typical Marine Corps right there, right? I don't give a fuck if you just got blown up with a grenade and shot. You got to fucking go qualify. Yeah. Holy shit. Bro. There goes Lance Corporal Santos to go qualify at the range trying to heal up or whatever. It's, it's a, wow, man. Wow. That's fucking wild. Um, and uh, is this now? Is this the uh, um, incident where you received the silver star? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So um, apparently, the Marine Corps thinks you did a good job. Apparently, they did. Yeah. You know, I think uh, at the time, I'll just give it up to you know Lieutenant Colonel Burke. I mean, uh, Lieutenant Tim Burke, which was my platoon commander, and uh, Captain um, Trent Gibson for just 
looking out for me and recognizing the actions that day. Uh, I think at the, at the time I was the only E3 to ever even be nominated for a Silver Star, let alone receive it. Uh, a couple of years later, I got, actually got it as a corporal, but my citation has it as a as a lance corporal. And not only that, right? Going back to my background and stuff. Now looking at it, and this is the first time I've actually told the story on camera. But like for me, I want to use it as an example. You know, I still am, I believe, the only E3. Salvadorian infantrymen to have such a, a high award in the Marine Corps. And I don't say that to brag. I, I say that just because I think we do need to recognize within ourselves that we've had astonishing accomplishments. So other younger people have an example of what you can accomplish, you know, when, when, uh, you put your mind to it. Yeah, well, exactly. So I think this is a perfect point to get into, um, some other stuff that you did accomplish, like, like, uh, getting into MARSOC and becoming a Marine Raider. Yeah. Yeah. So, how um, when eventually did you get into that? So I was actually gonna get out, man, and I was gonna go back to South Central LA without a fucking plan. Um, and then uh, my platoon uh, sergeant was working in Quantico and had rumors that there was gonna be a brand new unit that was being stood up, and he knew that if I went back to South Central, I'll probably just fall back into the same stuff I did before the Marine Corps. So he made a significant effort to help me reenlist and help me reenlist. Uh, and me and my boy were off to good old Camp Lejeune in 2005, uh, where it was the beginning of what eventually would become MARSOC, uh, both from Force Recon, Foreign Military Training Unit, and the Marine Special Operations Advisory Group. All that came together, and I got luckily uh, enough to be grandfathered in, so I was one of the initial plank holders as a 0311 infantryman. I wasn't recon ever um, at all. And uh, I found myself um, a year later uh, doing special operations in uh, the Western Sahara. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So talk to me about that experience, man, your experience in MARSOC. Um, so for me, I, I, in MARSOC, I think I've had a very uh, unique uh, career. You know, everybody, when we first started, was running and gunning. Um, at that time, we were working other missions in, in Africa. I worked Africa for about eight years where we we're doing a lot of foreign internal defense and security force assistance stuff, which just means, you know, we're working by, with, and through our allies and other partner nation forces to address counterterrorism issues in countries that nobody gave a fuck about. Uh, but as special operations, we have the ability to get into areas and influence the environment in many ways to prevent certain things from happening. Um, at the time, so I got to run around with units in Africa and, you know, ride camels through the Saharan desert and doing counterterrorism operations um, in areas where I never thought I was going to be as a as a dude coming from uh, South Central Los Angeles, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I've learned French. I was able to communicate with the partner nation forces and advise and assist them. In, in different areas of the world where people had just disregarded and don't think anything's going on. That kind of took me to th three different continents. So as a MARSOG operator, I was able to work Africa. Um, I did a Afghanistan in limited capacity. And then uh, I eventually ended up working uh, Asia Pacific as well and, and addressing some of the larger strategic level issues that we're having um, there in the United States. So I did a lot of very different stuff where people you know, the, the classic image of an operator is somebody throwing your kid on and then just going and doing a direct action raid, getting off a helicopter and coming back out. And yes, I did some of that stuff. Um, but for me, uh, what continues to, to drive and what drove me to stay for, you know, 15 years as an operator, it was very interesting for me to understand that these small group of individuals with these traits have the ability to solve complex problems in a dynamic environment and have strategic level impacts. Um, whereas in the infantry, right, like you're just told where to go, what to do and how to do it. I now had the opportunity to analyze situations and look at a problem set and not be told how to solve the problem, but give the recommendation of what the best course of action can be to potentially have the desired effects of what we want that's in support of whatever objectives and whatever theater special operation command we're working in. Wow. Um, I imagine too, um, being in that unit and being around 
uh, other Marines that are operating at that level of capacity helped you become that person that you're describing right now? Yeah, 100%. Um, you know, it's always a test every day, specifically in a small team, right? You're responsible for all kind of different stuff. And my specialty ended up uh, becoming intelligence. Um, so I would always surround myself with intellectual people that had a more of a strategic objective to understand why we're doing what we're doing and being able to mitigate the risks. Because I look back on that situation of Lance Corporal Santos in 2004, and looking back at it, I was like, man, nobody know, g gave me any guidance of how I could have mitigated some of the risk factors to prevent dudes from getting hurt or killed. Now, as a soft team that has the ability to mold the environment and plan their own missions, I really took it personal. Um, I would sit with other individuals and come up with courses of actions that would um, highlight what our weaknesses were, what the enemy's weaknesses were, and be able to plan around that so we can give the commander the best options possible for us to mitigate the risks of the situation we were going to go into. Wow. How many tours did you do? So I ended up doing nine employments total uh, before I retired. Wow. Yeah. Um, out of all these places that you've got to visit, did you get a chance to experience the culture um, outside the working environment? Oh, 100%. Yeah, um, Africa it really stood out to me. It's a wild, wild, wild west out there. And uh, for a long time, right, it was a hotbed and it continues to be a hotbed of, of terrorist activity. But the culture there um, has always remained like really solid. Um, the way those guys live their lives in the Saharan desert is, is, is completely baffling how they do gather their food, find water, um, and, and just live without is super harsh. But Southeast Asia is another crazy uh, area where a lot of people don't think there's terrorist activities or counter-terrorist operations there. If you look at some of the stuff uh, now, you can see that, you know, like uh, within the Filipino culture, Indonesian culture, and Malaysia, there's a lot of influence there. And once you start analyzing the population, um, it's great to see how much historical um, historical things continue to play a factor in what we're doing. And you're only going to be able to get that by getting out and actually talking to, to the population. Um, luckily, we had that opportunity to do that a lot of the time. So. Mm. Now, did you get to go to a lot of uh, uh, schools being in Marsoc? Yeah. <clears throat> what was your favorite one? Uh, <laughs> so... Depends on what they're doing, man. Like uh, I told you, so my uh, I I ended up leaving as a team chief, um, and then as you progress through the team, right, like your element member and then operations chief, and each each one of them has their own specialty. My specialty uh, ended up being uh, intelligence gathering, right. So for me, uh, I like the that portion of it, right, and understanding the human factors behind what people do, why they do it, how they do it and then gathering all the information to put a, a, a plan together. I think I'm very uh, analytical at times and just because I, I take it so personal, um, you know, I like that sort of work where we're doing surveillance, counter surveillance um, and analyzing human terrain to understand what we're gonna do. But more specifically, right, I think it's very interesting to be on the, the front side of a planning operation where you need to gather all that intelligence to actually plan uh, the mission because a lot of what we see is just the end state right which mm -hmm. is getting on the helicopters going in and doing that direct yeah. action stuff but taking the time to properly plan and understand why we're going out there who we're going after and why it's important what kind of effects it's going to have is something that I, that I truly um, understand you know I've done all the other stuff too yeah died but yeah, crazy. Uh, what? Uh, yeah. <laughs> what kind of um, I'm really interested in the surveillance ops um you know what what can you walk us through maybe like an operation like on some of the stuff you did to gather intel um in some of these countries uh i'll talk about some of the methodologies maybe that we yeah. use uh um for us i think it's very interesting to understand that uh it's not always a, a team effort right so me as an individual i've had the opportunity to go to certain schools that allow you to operate as an individual on on your own um, and then doing the analysis before 
you get into a country or validating some assumptions that other people had uh, while you get on the ground with another individual was pretty interesting to me. So um, did some of that stuff. Um, it had the effects that we wanted to, uh, I think, at certain times. But more importantly, I think as I was mentoring other guys on the teams and uh, and showing them what the importance of that stuff, uh, they were able to gather what, what I had previously experienced in different areas of the world because, as you know, right, like this area of the city is different from this area of the city and this population thinks this way. So doing that kind of stuff in Africa, understanding how it was done in Afghanistan and then understanding how we're doing it in Asia Pacific and bringing that perspective together was pretty interesting to me. Yeah, you had to, I imagine you had to like get accustomed to the culture, of whatever area, specific area you were working in. Um, so you don't really stand out, you know, know, know the traditions and one hundred percent. Wow, man. That's wild. That's intense. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you retired as a master sergeant. I did. Um, I want to get into transitioning, but, um, you know, in, if you have anything else you want to get in there from your military service, uh, we could cover that now, or we could just go straight into the transition. I'm good, man. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to me, uh, 21 years of service, um, nine tours, you know, the situation you just talked about being shot. Um, what is it, was it like for you transitioning back into the civilian world? I would honestly say that it took significant effort, right? Um, luckily for us, we have, uh, nonprofit organizations like the Honor Foundation that take the time to really invest in effectively understanding how difficult transition can be. Unfortunately, right, for the rest of our military service members, it's 100% garbage and they don't take the time to invest as much as they did in the beginning to mold this individual to uh, help him transition out into an effective part of uh, society. So for me, I actually went through the Honor Foundation. It took three months of me, one, understanding and doing a bunch of self-assessment and identifying gaps and identifying issues, mental issues, physical issues that I had never done before because we were just always running and gunning all the time. Um, so I think that was the most important phase for me is understanding who Danny Santos is and understanding that my identity is not a Marine Raider or a Marine or a service member. Um, it was a phase in my life. And now I had to do the self-assessment to understand what my emotional drivers were, what my positive traits were, what my negative traits are, and how I can address those. And the way I did that was by taking the time to do all that self-reflection. I established mentors for myself I have a board of directors that I call that address my significant weaknesses. So when I have an issue that I don't understand, I call them and lean on them for advice and, and guidance. And by doing that methodology, right, I was able to assess that I wanted to continue to contribute to society. I wanted to continue to have strategic impacts on national security issues so I can feel back that I was giving uh, to the dudes. And then um, I wanted to use my analytical skills and my problem solving and effective team working traits to continue to give back. Um, so I was able to find an organization that I currently work for called Spirit of America, and where we are a nonprofit organization that works by, with, and through diplomats and service members overseas to support uh, alliances and give uh, our partners uh, the ability to continue to live a, a free and better life. And the way we do this is by supporting the objectives and goals of service members and diplomats overseas. Wow. Wow. So when you were going through this process of self-reflecting, you mentioned that, <clears throat> you know, you were identifying issues. Um, I'm just curious, what issues um, were you able to identify uh, within yourself that you were going through? Um, one of the biggest ones, right, uh, I had all my mental issues that I initially had suffered from thinking that I had left something on the table and that I easily could have continued to be in the Marine Corps and run and gun and get payback for all the dudes that had passed away. So I had that psychological issue to overcome, right? So I had to take some self-reflection and really look at the positive sides and all the great things that I had done, but through the eyes of somebody else. 
Um, so when I went and got therapy, uh, and that's what they highlighted. It's like, no, let's write down all your accomplishments. Let's look at them unbiasedly. And from somebody else's perspective, do you think this is normal? Nine deployments, three different continents, first generation Salvadorian. I was like, you've been awarded these things. You've had effective teams. You've made strategic goals for the world. I was like, you're a great individual. Like my imposter syndrome is huge all the time, man. I don't think I belong in certain levels of society. Um, and when I changed my mindset to understand that, you know what? It's not about me bragging about what I've accomplished. It's about me acknowledging my own hard work and then using that to be an example for other people uh, to use as they transition. Um, and that's how I've effectively been able to now talk about uh, what I've done, why I've done it, what drives me, uh, what continues to give me my purpose in, in belief in life. Um, so those, those assessments allowed me to identify who Danny Santos is, right? I am an individual that loves to be surrounded by hardworking people that have a strategic mindset that want to solve problems that benefit the world. And whoever I can align myself with or whatever organization has that purpose and belief behind them, I will 100% support. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And it, um, you know, what you feel that imposter uh, syndrome is, is a very common story amongst the veteran community. And it blows my mind, man, because somebody like you, <clears throat> you know, I was out of the Marines before MARSOC even started, but, you know, uh, and I was in the infantry, but walking around um, and seeing these recon guys walk around, you know, with the scuba bubble on their chest and jump weeks on, like, we we look up and we're like, oh, damn, that's fucking badass, man, dude, that's a recon guy, you know, we, we understand the, the level of hard work that gets put into the process of becoming that, yeah. um, and then operating at that level, so... Um, and then for you to spend 21 years in and, uh, you know, retire as a master sergeant, um, you know, uh, one rank under a sergeant major, right? Uh, uh, and for you to come out and feel like you might not belong in certain areas is just wild, man. You know what I mean? Because us vets look up to veterans like you, you know what I mean? Who's who's done all these things, uh, knowing the hard work and determination and you know, the fucking not, not quit that you had to had inside of you to, to make it and accomplish the things that you accomplished. 100%. Yeah. Wow, man. Um, yeah, man, I, I continue to struggle with it and I have to take a step back with it all the time. Right. Um, most recently, one of my greatest accomplishments right now, I just finished my master's from USC. Nice. Um, you know, and I purposely put myself in that situation because I identified some gaps that I needed to address. But not only did I want to address those gaps, it was a personal goal for me. Uh, and I tell this story now is on the last day on our graduation, you know, I had a small group of friends and I was just like, guys, I haven't told anybody this. I was like, but the last time I was on USC campus, I was actually being arrested for uh, shoplifting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. uh, and then coming from that, to now walking the stage and earning a master's in business from such an elite school, right, uh, uh, is, is a great accomplishment. But even then, at certain times, you come back here like, okay, now I'm part of this larger network. I used to walk around this campus and have envy of the individuals that would go there because I never thought I was going to have the opportunity ever to accomplish something like that. Yeah. Um, so I just try to tell my story as much as possible now, man. So other people don't feel that way. Or if they are feeling that way, understand that that is not, uh, the way reality is. It's just your own internal barriers in your head that you put amongst yourself to say, Hey, I don't belong here or I'm not worth it, but you need to flip that mentality around and use your traits and understand that you can accomplish it. As long as you have an effective plan, surround yourself with people that want to push you beyond your, your limit. Um, and don't, you know, take the easy way out and just say, I can't do it because you can't. Dude, what'd you still on USC campus? I was actually, uh, hanging around with a bunch of dudes that used to ride on the buses and, uh, I was stealing acrylic and paints. <laughs> <laughs> hey, in the nineties, man, yeah. the acrylic and paints were a hot commodity, right? It was, man. <laughs> man. Um, Danny, I'm curious, is there, uh, any, um, routine or specific process that you go through every day uh, to keep your mind sharp? 
Yeah, as, as a matter of fact, uh, um, you know, now I, I take the time every morning to uh, start slow. Uh, I meditate as much as I can now, so I've dedicated myself to doing a bunch of internal reflection during my meditation, set my purpose for the days, and I know I'm a very, uh, like, checklist-oriented kind of guy. So I finish my meditation. I go up to my whiteboard up in my office. I work from the house now, and I prioritize what I need to do, do for the day. Um, I'm starting to implement new things into my strategy where now I'm going to have a short, <clears throat> a mid, and a long-term plan that has specific milestones set up in the day so I'm not just being uh, reactive every day on what I need to accomplish. And that'll give me my, my five-year plan of where I want to be. Because one of my greatest things right now is starting small, building those mid to long-term goals so I can accomplish what my larger goal is now for my daughter. <clears throat> it is to establish generational wealth mm -hmm. and uh, set her up in a way that I was never set up um, going forward. Nice. Well, we're going to get ready to wrap it up, man. Um, <clears throat> any last words before we cut the tape? No, that's it. Uh, I just want to reach out to everybody, man, and understand that, like, if you're going through a transition, right, uh, it's it's a hard and difficult thing to do. Uh, reach out to your guys, establish milestones for yourself, look internal, and take the time to do that self-assessment to understand who you really are and where you want to be, but more importantly, how you want to formulate your plan to be where you want to be in the short, mid, and long term, and surround yourself with other people that are going to push you beyond your comfort zone. Uh, so don't you, so you don't lose your identity and you create a new one for yourself. And where could people find you or, uh, and, or what you're doing? You mentioned some transition programs and stuff. How could people, um, find that? Yeah. The main on it, uh, that I went through, so it's called the honor foundation. So I'd just jump on honor.org. There's other organizations out there like SODIF and, and commit that are helping individuals go through that transitional process. So hit them up. If you guys want to donate, donate it's uh, it'll go to a good cause. Awesome. Hey, thanks for being here, Danny. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Push it to the limit, I can't go no more. Red light, no way I'm coming back home. Long dirt road all on my own. I'ma be the greatest, draw my name in the stone. Draw my name in the stone. Yeah, I'm coming back home. Yeah, I'm coming back home.